invite your attention this morning, if you would please, to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll be beginning at verse 3. But if you'll just hold your Bibles open there, we will, we will get to that in just a brief moment. But before we do, let's recite our motto together, shall we, once again, together. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, a piece of humor has been circulating on the internet for some time about a polar bear cub that approached his mother one day and asked, Mom, am I a polar bear? <laughs> well, of course you are, honey, she replied with a smile. Okay, said the cub and patted off. Later, he found his dad out by the iceberg. Dad, am I a polar bear? <laughs> sure you are, son, said his dad, wondering why in the world is someone asked such a silly thing. Well, the next day, the cub asked the question again and again. Are you and mom polar bears? He asked his dad. You are? Well, then does that make me a polar bear? 100% polar bear? Finally, his parents couldn't stand it any longer. Son, you're driving us crazy with this question. You are a polar bear. Why in the world do you keep asking that question? Cub looked up and confessed and said, Because I'm freezing! Oh. <laughs> A writer by the name of Paul Lee tells that story. And then he adds these important words. He says, Sometimes I go to my Heavenly Father and I say, Am I really your child? Are you really my father? Because sometimes I doubt. And other times I don't act much like you. And I'm not sure if I'm the kind of person you would want to call your child. And sometimes things don't go well for me. And I, I have pain. And I anger. And I have many other things. Is that okay for one of your children? And then, though I can't see it, I can feel it, the warm hug, the reassuring smile, the affirmation of sonship. I don't have to be perfect. I'm not expected to never feel pain or worry or care. But I'm expected to know whose I am and that I belong. And that for whatever extravagant, outrageous reason, I've been loved and adopted by the one true. God. <laughs> Our lesson today from Ephesians begins like this. Look at it with me. Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. My friends, let me put your minds to rest. You are a genuine polar bear. <laughs> that is, you are a genuine son or daughter of God. Believe it. God has adopted you into His family. And several of our, of our lessons and messages over the past few months have affirmed that fact. You and I are children of God. <laughs> our lesson says that we were chosen before the creation of the world. We were chosen before the creation of the world. What an awe-inspiring thought. That we were 
chosen before the creation of the world to be his children. <laughs> Another piece of children's humor. That is how we got our belly buttons. <laughs> As we were coming down the conveyor belt from heaven, God using his index finger said, I'll take that one and that one and that one. <laughs> Do you have a belly button? <laughs> then you were chosen. <laughs> but you might protest, Pastor, everyone has belly buttons. Well, maybe everyone is chosen. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And maybe we just have the good fortune of knowing it. Right? But you protest. But don't some Christians believe in predestination? You know, the idea that some people are chosen while other people are not chosen. They do. They do believe it. But I won't be drawn into that discussion today. However, I will tell one of my favorite stories on that theme. Years ago, two ministers agreed to swap pulpits on Sunday morning as a sign of ecumenical goodwill. Each of them uh, would preach that day in the other church's pulpit. The, day, the date was 1850, as you can tell by the picture. The place was Boston, Massachusetts. And one of the ministers was Lyman Beecher, one of the best known of Boston's great preachers. The other preacher was a neighboring Presbyterian minister who believed very strongly in predestination, an idea of which Beecher couldn't accept. Last Sunday morning, each of these preachers set out for the other's church and a block or two away to keep the appointment. They, they met on the sidewalk halfway between the two churches and they stopped to exchange their greetings. The Presbyterian minister said, Dr. Beecher, I wish to call your attention to the fact that before God created the world, before he set the stars in motion, he arranged that I was to preach in your pulpit this morning and you were to preach in mine. Is that so, said Dr. Beecher, glaring at his Calvinist friend? Then I won't do it. And with that, he turned and went back to his own church to preach in his own pulpit that morning. Of course, maybe that was what God planned all along. Who knows? Well, we'll leave the question of whether everyone is chosen to God, right? We'll agree to do that. The important thing is that we know that we were chosen not because we're better than anyone else. We're not. None of us acts like God's children all the time. <laughs> None of us act like God's children all the time. That's the meaning of grace. But somehow in the providence of God, before the creation of the world, we were chosen. But what were we chosen for? What were we chosen for? Paul tells us right here, we were chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in God's sight. We were chosen to be holy and blameless in God's sight. Oops. <laughs> you knew it, didn't you? There's a catch. <laughs> Look at Ephesians 1 verse 4 here. Paul says, chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Now, the last thing I want to do today is to make you feel guilty. Because too much talk about being holy and blameless has a tendency to do that for us, doesn't it? But think this through with me for a minute today. Why do you think, why do you think God created you? From the teachings of Jesus, I believe God created us to be happy and healthy, and to be whole human beings. That's why God 
God created us. God created us for a healthy relationship with other people and with Him. God created us to be happy and healthy and all that we can be. Isn't that what you would hope for your children? Isn't it? We're not being unreasonable here, are we? No, that's what we would want for our children. How's that working out for you? Hmm. Are you happy and healthy and all you can be? Maybe from time to time you come up a little short. I do. That's all right. Even polar bears get cold. <coughs> but that's what God wants for us. A man by the name of Ken Lindner wrote a book entitled Crunch Time. And in that book, he tells about his father, a man who had an enormous influence on him. And he says that ever since he can remember, his dad cherished his physical health. And for that reason, with, with great discipline, he says, his father exercised regularly. Whether it was walking an hour each day, swimming, or ice skating. Through the years, Ken said he watched his dad walk in the rain and the snow just to keep himself fit. His dad didn't smoke. He was careful to get enough sleep. And by valuing his health, his dad at the age of 97 was able to continue working three days a week. He continued to be sharp and fit, had a great zest for life, and derived the most possible out of his life. He said that his dad was a role model for younger workers in his office. He kept a youthful appearance, a high level of energy, and a contagious enthusiasm for life. His dad missed only three or four days of work over 37 years of his life. And while genetics no doubt played a significant role in his good health and longevity, his value, his high value and regard for his physical well-being through the years also was a major factor in this celebration of healthy and vital living. Well, that is Ken Linder's heritage. Ken inherited his dad's value system and thus is protective of his own physical health. And he says that no dessert, no dessert, no serving of macaroni and cheese, no matter how good it is, and no other fattening food or drink for him outweighs being fit and healthy. Cigarettes, recreational drugs, alcohol are out of the question for him. And Ken is somewhat of an exercise fanatic himself. He's the kind of guy you would hate to have next to you at the gym. But let me ask you this. Do you think he's wrong to cherish his physical health like that? Do you think he's wrong? Don't you suspect that he's living like God means for us all of us? God wants us all to be happy and healthy. And ultimately this morning, the road to happiness is paved with good habits. The road to happiness is paved with good habits. If you disagree, you can line up, line up afterwards and tell me afterwards. Be great. <coughs> but let me also hasten to add to this that Ken... Linder is just as committed to his spiritual life and to his family, to his relationship with his friends. In other words, he, he's doing the practical things that inevitably lead to a good life. That's all that God demands out of each of us. Doing what we can do. You see, life is a matter of making good choices. Life is a matter of making good choices. We say it to our children all the time, don't we? Make good choices. Make good decisions. You remember when they're pulling out of the driveway headed to whatever they're headed to? And we like, make good choices. Yeah, they listen, don't they? Yeah. But we all know it's true. Important. Now, contrast 
Ken Linder's story with that of a man who's a legend of country music named George Jones. Jones was a country music icon from the old school. A lot of his songs were very stereotypical country songs about cheating and drinking, those kinds of songs. But the fact that George Jones had a drinking problem himself was no secret. But on March the 6th, 1999, country music fans were horrified to hear that George Jones was critically injured when he crashed his Lenex, his Lenex, his Lexus, <laughs> <laughs> crashed his Lexus into a bridge in Nashville. And the investigation showed that George had been drunk at the wheel. Thankfully, he recovered and he kept performing until his death just a couple of years ago. But two months after that accident, he put out a new album, and the album was called Cold Hard Truth. And out of that, on, on that album, was a song entitled Choices. And ironically, the hook line of that song, maybe some of you know it, the hook line of that song went like this. I'm living and dying with the choices. I'm living and dying with the choices I made. We all do, don't we? We all do. Life is a matter of making good choices. That's true of all of life. But listen to this. The power to choose is one of the most precious gifts God has given us. The power to choose to make the right choice. Author Michael Haley tells about an elderly woman whom he calls Mrs. S. And he says that Mrs. S had lived alone for many years and got out of only with the help of a wheelchair. And every Sunday, she wheeled herself into the side aisle of the sanctuary of their church, one without handicap access where she worshipped enthusiastically. She always seemed to be up. People smiled when they were around her. One evening, Mrs. S., he said, spoke to the youth of their church and was asked how she could always be so alive, so full of joy all the time. And she responded, because, she said, I choose to. She said, I had no choice about living the last half of my life as a widow had no choice of having one of my sons killed in the Korean War. And I certainly didn't choose to have to ride around this, in this wheelchair for the past 10 years. But one thing I did choose was to be happy. And I decided to make the best of every day and to see the best in every person. <laughs> wow, folks, isn't, isn't that how God means for us all to live? <laughs> Now, I realize this morning that not all of us can be as disciplined as Mr. Ken Lindner. And not all of us can be as determined to choose a positive attitude as Mrs. X. But that is what grace is all about. That's what grace is all about. When the Apostle Paul writes that God chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight, God knew that we could never be totally holy and blameless. He knew that. But through His love, that is how God sees us. And that is how God hopes we will be. Not for His benefit, but for our benefit. God only wants the best for us. Just as every loving parent wants only the best for their children. A life of health, wholeness, physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual wholeness is the path that leads to the very best life possible. Abundant life, we might call it. Abundant life. And you know this, what we need most to see is that there is one choice that we need to make that makes all the other choices much easier. That is to choose Christ. Amen. Choose
choose Christ. <clears throat> Always seek His approval. Always seek His will. Always seek after Him. And He said if you'll do that, all these other things will be added to you. Amen. It makes all the other choices so much easier to make when we seek Him first. <clears throat> Most of you are familiar with the name Sarin Kierkegaard. <clears throat> Kierkegaard, a 19th century philosopher, and theologian, and poet. He's known as the greatest Christian thinker of his generation. And he believed that no person is truly alive who simply acts as a spectator toward the ultimate issues of life. The only person who knows real existence is the person who here and now, infinitely and forever, gives himself or herself to the call of Christ. The only person who knows real existence is the person who here and now, infinitely and forever, gives themselves completely over to the call of Christ in their life. Kierkegaard's philosophy is sometimes called Christian existentialism, which emphasizes immediate commitment. And Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. The Christian existentialist would say, I choose, therefore I am. And Kierkegaard contended that there are only two kinds of people, the drivers and the drifters. He said that he felt compelled to run after every person in the street and ask him this question. Are you alert? or inert? Are you a master or a slave? A creator or a creature? A lifter or a leaner? The essence of our humanity is in our choices. And the primary choice we confront is whether to make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. That's the primary choice. And when we do that, Everything else falls into its proper place. The French existentialist and atheist, Jean-Paul Sartre, took the exact opposite approach to life from Kierkegaard. He was of the opinion that no such choice existed. And in his play, they wrote, No Exit, he portrayed persons locked in a cage. They cannot escape their imprisonment and they're in despair. But halfway through the play, the cage door swings open. Still, those inside <coughs> refuse to leave the cage. The opportunity to escape presents itself, but they do nothing about it. Why? Well, because they've been given, they've been given in, they gave in to hopelessness and despair. Couldn't see it. Let me ask you this morning. Have you given in to hopelessness and despair? Have you? I hope not. Because there is an open door. And that door is Christ. Amen. That door is Christ. He is the light, the truth, and the way. Anyone who comes to, to the Father must come. Him. He is the door. He's the way. Make that choice and all the other important choices in life will get much easier if you put Christ first. Amen. We began this morning by asking if you were a polar bear. And of course, you are. You've been chosen before the creation to be God's child. Part of God's very own family. Psychologists John Grinder and Richard Bandler tell an interesting story about polar bears. It seems that some years ago, the Denver Zoo went through a major renovation. And they decided to build a large naturalistic environment to house a polar bear. Unfortunately, the polar bear arrived at the zoo before the naturalistic enclosure was ready for it. That meant that they had to put it in a cage until the new grand environment was the cage 
that it was put in temporarily was just big enough that the polar bear could take three nice swinging steps in one direction, whirl up and around and come down and take three steps in the other direction, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. The polar bear spent many, many months in that cage with those bars that restricted its behavior in that way. But eventually, a large naturalistic environment into which they could release the polar bear was built around this cage on site. And when it was finally completed, the bear was sedated and the cage was removed from around the bear. <laughs> and you want to guess what happened? When the polar bear woke up, the bear woke up, took three steps slowly in one direction before whirling around and taking three steps in the other Back and forth, back and forth. The polar bear was no longer caged, but he wasn't free. Could that in any way describe your life this morning? Could that in any way describe where you are? It doesn't have to be. Because you have been chosen to be a child of God. God has provided an open door by which you can escape the cage of hopelessness and despair. And you can live life abundantly. That's what He's provided, if we so choose. That door is Christ. And I'm asking you today, won't you let him set you free today? Help us to hold our heads.
heads high and to throw our shoulders back and to walk on tiptoe to whoever we are around to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Thank you for giving us boldness and courage. Thank you for giving us big faith. Big dreams as you help us to accomplish and to set them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray, our wonderful Lord. Amen. Praise His name. Aren't you glad you're a polar bear today? And I think I can promise you that you won't get cold today. <laughs> Shall we stand and receive the benediction? My brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are a family. May we never forget whose we are. We have worshipped together in the presence of God. And now we, we go from this place in His strength in the knowledge of whose we are. His strength that fills our lives. And as we go, may our efforts for the kingdom bring to Christ glory and honor now and forever. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you. God bless you. You are